Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Ben Gooderson on May 31, 2022. Ben is an author of middle-grade novels and had recently published his fourth book, The Einsteins of Vista Point. His previous books are the Winter House Trilogy, which have been translated into ten languages and even received notice from some state, national, and international awards. I started the interview by asking Ben where he grew up and what was religious life like growing up. Well, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. That's a... Uh... My father was born and raised in Seattle, my mother in Portland, Oregon, but they met in Seattle, and, and I have two brothers and two sisters, who are all born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and I grew up uh, Jewish. My ancestry is Jewish. Uh, actually, all my grandparents were from Russia uh, way back in the early part of the 20th century. So religious life for me was within the context of Judaism. A very reformed Judaism, maybe some listeners will, will know, you know, Judaism can kind of go from uh, reform all the way up to orthodox or ultra-orthodox, and so we were more on the reform side. I had a bar mitzvah, all my, my, my brothers did as well when we reached the age of 13, and my parents were moderately religious, they became maybe slightly more religious or conservative, primarily in a social sense as they got older, I would say Judaism was a presence in my family's life in more like a cultural or social sense. I consider myself ethnically and culturally Jewish, although by the time I reached about my mid-30s, my wife and I were looking for a bit more of a spiritual grounding, you could say, and gravitated to the Baha'i faith, but that was well into my adult life. I'm wondering why it was in your 30s that you and your wife felt that you needed to look for uh, deeper spiritually. Why then? After my bar mitzvah, as I got a bit older, you know, into my teens, like a lot of probably young people, I began to sort of question the religion I was born into. And I don't know if rebel is quite the right word, but I think we all probably understand that a lot of young people reach an age where they start to question the religion of their family or the religion they're born into. I definitely did. It wasn't any major angst about it. I just sort of slowly kind of drifted away from Judaism, although, again, culturally continued to feel very, and still to this day, felt very connected to the Jewish tradition and, you know, Jewish love of scholarship and literature and entertainment, all those sorts of things that any culture or group can be very proud of. But really, in terms of feeling a spiritual connection to Judaism, for whatever reason, that kind of became a win of the way. My wife and I, you know, had three children and started actually in college. So our kids are well grown up now, adults, all three of them. Really through our 20s, just the struggle of uh, raising a family and trying to gain some financial traction and career and all that, really putting spiritual matters kind of on the back burner. But really, as I got into my early 30s, I... Personally, my own journey was I began to feel a bit adrift spiritually. I always felt that I was on something of a spiritual search or that I wanted to have some grounding in my life, some balance, some sense of meaning, some sense of direction. And then, frankly, I became definitely off track a bit personally as I got into my mid-30s and really felt that I needed some guardrails in my life and some real grounding. So we were living in the Southwest in New Mexico and Colorado at that time over about a 10-year period and came back to the Seattle area where we're both from and where we, we both went to the University of Washington, Seattle. I actually had heard about something called the Baha'i Faith when I was in my early 20s. I had been spending some time with some friends in Chicago and they gave me a car for the day and I asked them, are there any interesting sites to see in the area and one of them said yeah there's this temple it's in Wilmette and of course as I've come to know and now visited many times there is a beautiful Baha'i temple just north of Chicago maybe I don't know 20 miles at the most I'd say in the town of Wilmette 
And I went there. I was about 23 or 24 at the time. And it is it's undeniably a beautiful temple. It was built in the 1950s or completed in the 1950s. And it's quite a landmark in the area. And I went into this temple with the, you know, I'd driven there in this borrowed car. I went in and it was very nice. And I sat there and looked around and felt very peaceful. I can't say I actually had some thunderstroke where suddenly my religious path was altered and I felt some transformation. The name Baha'i, which I really didn't know, I'd never really heard about the Baha'i faith before, stayed in my mind simply by the fact of entering into that beautiful temple. So then fast forward a bit here, and uh, to this point, I mentioned my mid-30s when feeling a little bit adrift and coming back here to the Seattle area. One day I was in a town called Issaquah, which is about 20 minutes east of Seattle. And I had a medical appointment, and I parked the car, and I noticed on the street there, it's the, kind of the older part of downtown, of this town, Issaquah, I saw a tiny you know, storefront, or a little, little building, I guess I should say, and it said the Baha'i Faith Information Center, or something like that. And I thought, oh, there's that word Baha'i again. I, I remember going to that temple 10 plus years ago. So I went in there, and I found some literature there, I talked to a few people there, and steadily started reading more and more about the Baha'i faith and became very intrigued and, and felt that perhaps this was a path that could help me and perhaps help my wife and I in our relationship and to provide some foundation in a spiritual sense for our children, because I definitely beginning to feel that absence pretty keenly and felt it could be help to our family overall and to my life personally and to the relationship between my wife and me. So that's the journey that introduced me to the Baha'i faith and set me on a path to actually becoming a Baha'i in March of the year 2000. What was it initially that attracted you to want to learn more after you went into that storefront? I went in there, again, feeling a lot of like trepidation, I guess you could say. You know, whenever an individual encounters something of a religious orientation, I think particularly in this day and age, and maybe particularly in Western countries, and maybe maybe most particularly in America, uh, we're pretty wary of a lot of religious involvement. It's a very private thing. And, you know, if someone comes to the door, or you hear about something, and there's a tendency to, to kind of want to shy away from it. I totally am there with that instinct. The only reason I went into that little building that day in Issaquah is because I just remembered that word Baha'i in that temple and that state of my mind. So I thought, hmm, I, interesting that there's people who are Baha'is out over here. You know, I didn't really know what it was about. So I went in there and frankly, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, there's going to be something really weird here. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to bump up against something strange. I don't know why. That's probably a very unfair thing for me to confess, but that's what I thought. I was very wary of the whole thing. I went in there. There was a nice lady in there and there was all this nice literature and everything looked really nice. And one thing that caught my eye right away in a number of the like photographs and some of the literature that I picked up, there was a lot of diversity among individuals who seemed to be connected to this thing relatively unknown to me called the Baha'i faith. I saw a lot of different faces there, different colors, different backgrounds. And my wife is black or African-American and I'm white, Jewish. And our kids, you know, are mixed. I don't know if that's the politically correct term, but that's kind of a term we've used for a while. Maybe there's a better term I should be using. But anyway, so seeing right away that there was a lot of diversity uh, within the Baha'i faith and that it was uh, seemed uh, promoted and kind of a foundational aspect of the faith was very reassuring, just sort of on an emotional level to me. Whatever the theology of beliefs were, which I didn't know yet when I walked in there, but just sort of getting a sense that, oh, this is a religion that attracts a lot of different people. So I picked up some of the literature and I started reading about it and I realized pretty quickly, well, this faith is all about unity. It's about building bonds among all sorts of people and not trying to promote or privilege one, you know, sort of point of view or one group or anything like that above another. And I found that a very appealing and compelling vision. I went on to learn that that's really the heart of the Baha'i faith, the notion of unity. There's one God, there's one humankind, and as Baha'is will say, there's really only one religion that's been a religion of God that's been unfolding across history from all time, and that all these 
great prophets have been basically delivering a single message to humans across history. I don't want to go too deep into that aspect of it, but really learning those things, this notion of oneness and unity, I became very excited to learn more about the Baha'i faith. But I will tell you something. I told myself, I'm going to keep reading all this literature I picked up and books and online stuff until I find, and this is the phrase I used in my mind, the weird thing. (laughs) I felt sure that sooner or later, I would just discover something that just sort of like, you know, logically or from a theological standpoint or an ethical standpoint or uh, some interpretation of history or something. I just thought, you know, there's going to be something that I just won't be able to wrap my mind around. So when I hit that thing, I'm going to back out and it'll just be a nice, sort of nice brief little detour in this kind of interesting, peaceful Baha'i thing. And then I'll be done with it. But as you can see where the story's going, I never hit the weird thing. And I just became more and more intrigued by the Baha'i faith and felt more and more that the message and what I was reading were things that really resonated with me that I really believed in. I uh, started talking it over with my wife and I didn't want to progress if she didn't feel comfortable with it as well. She's from a Christian background. And as I've already mentioned, I'm from a Jewish background. So we were starting in two very different places but I wanted to feel that we were somewhat in lockstep on this and that I wasn't just dragging her, that I'd gotten all excited about something and I was going to spin off to some, uh, onto something all on my own. And But she found the message very attractive as well, and we decided to become Baha'is together. So th- those are kind of the steps that occurred for us. It took place over at least a year or so as we came to know more of the Baha'is in in the area and learn more about the faith. And that, that's really how it happened. Ben, when did you discover the writer within you? Well, that was a slow process because I really discovered or was aware of the reader in me from the earliest age. I always loved books, and I really attribute that love of books and literature to both of my parents, maybe my mother in particular. My father was a criminal defense attorney and quite a notable, well-known, and very respected uh, gentleman and figure in the city of Seattle. As I say, criminal defense attorney and really defended kind of the worst of the worst. He really believed that everyone needed a voice in society, and he was their voice. And he was really a great man. Everyone who knew my father really loved him and respected him. And I appreciated his values and his approach to life. He was an incredible public speaker. He could just get up and just cast a spell over people, and just the word just came to him when he got up in front of people. He wrote beautiful letters, and he loved to read, particularly the newspaper and magazines. And so I sort of saw my father steeped in that kind of language all the time. He could just put words together and and put these very uh, clear, coherent, reasonable arguments together on any level. My mother was, by her own admission, not really nearly the scholar my father was, she had not grown up sort of thinking she was a good student by her own admission. She would readily confess that. But she went on after my four siblings and, and I were all born to begin taking classes at the University of Washington. And she went on to get her Ph.D. She hmm. just kept grinding away. And I really admired that tenacity. And she filled the house with books and she was always studying. So I really owe my parents a huge debt of gratitude for giving me and my siblings this wonderful model of a love of reading, a love of books, a love of scholarship. And there were always books in the house, and I can't ever recall not knowing how to read. I mean, I know I didn't know how to read when I was, you know, two or three or four, but somehow by the time I was four or five, it seemed like all I was doing re- was reading books. So I love to read, and books have always been my, you know, like among my best friends, my constant companions. I'm, I'm a huge bookworm. So when I got into my 20s and I was I was a school teacher for many years, uh, for 10 years, I started trying to write a little bit here and there, different things, just because I loved to read. And that's when I really started to discover the writer in me. But again, I, you know, I was, as you can see, really unable to answer your primary question, Warren, until I sort of explored how much of a reader I was, because discovering the writer in me was secondary to fully acknowledging and understanding how much I love books overall. So after we moved up here, just to connect to the story I was telling earlier, by the time I was 34 or so, I had been a school teacher, two public schools, one on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico, 
and one in a small town in Colorado. And then coming up here to the Seattle area, I got on at Microsoft. And I ended up working at Microsoft for about 17 years across a range of roles. But after a while in the background, every night I would sit down and write for an hour. And I really owe a huge debt of gratitude to my wife for that, for arranging the family life and granting me that space and that time to be able to do that and explore that side of myself. And I just kept writing and writing and writing years of just sort of fruitless exploration and not knowing what I was doing as a writer. But I just kept practicing at it, I guess you could say. I thought I was writing books that people would read, but really what I was doing was practicing to become a better writer. And that's the journey of of discovery of, of the love of writing and creativity. What inspired you to write middle grade novels? I've always loved that age range of literature. I love classics, Tom Sawyer, Anne of Green Gables, Treasure Island, you know, all these books people have heard of. And then when I was a kid, I loved books by Roald Dahl. You know, I'm of the age where Roald Dahl was super popular when I was a kid. I mean, he continues to be popular now, but the books were actually coming out when I was a kid in grade school. And, the you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And, and there was a book called The Phantom Toll Booth that I loved. And there was a book by John Bellairs called The House with a Clock in Its Walls. For some reason in that age range, when you're about fourth, fifth grade, you know, those books were really meaningful to me and really fired my imagination. And even as I went on to read adult books or older books as I grew older, of course, those books always lived in my memory as real touchstones and real comfort to me. I I always look back at them really fondly. So in in my mind, I always thought, you know, maybe someday I'll try to write a book for that audience. But I, I never really pursued it very seriously. But then one day, my youngest daughter, uh, Natalie, she goes by Nada now. We were near our house, and she she was quite a writer herself, always was writing stories, very creative, fiercely intelligent person. And we went to a little lake by our house, and she said, let's take notebooks and write stories and draw pictures. And I said, okay. And we went there and sat by the lake. It was a beautiful spring day. And I just started drawing a picture of like what I saw around me, the mountains and everything, and and on the back of the paper, I started writing a story. I don't know, the idea of Winter had the, the name Winter House for like the name of like some kind of cool hotel in the mountains came to me. And I wrote a few paragraphs on the back of the paper and I read it to my daughter and she said, I like that. You should write the whole book. I just kind of laughed it off or, you know, didn't really think, you know, didn't think much about it. But in time, she really, about a year later, she really encouraged me to start writing the book. And so did my other kids. And then my wife did, and it was kind of a little bit of a joke, a, you know, kind of a friendly, teasy kind of thing. But I just thought, well, I'm trying to write all this other stuff, but maybe I'll try to write this Winter House book. So I sat down and, and started writing it. And it took me a few years back and forth and trying this thing and that thing. And ultimately, it turned into a real book. And so I really owe my <laughs> – I keep talking about the people I owe debts of gratitude to, but I definitely owe my daughter a debt of gratitude for that. But – You know, Warren, if it's not too much, I got to say, I feel that way about my entire family because they're all very creative. If I may, I don't want to detour, but my my wife is quite an artist, and that's very inspiring to me. That sort of led me forward to see her love of art and painting. And, And my son is quite a graphic artist, and my daughter lives in Detroit. She makes her living off of her art. And then my the other daughter, Natalie, or Nada, she's quite a collage artist. And I guess my point is, It's really a beautiful thing, and it's been very inspiring and helpful to me as a creator of stories to see how all the people in my family, my wife and my three kids we have, are so steeped in their own creative process. And I've really admired seeing that in all of them, and that's really been a sustaining thing for me to see that in in my family. Ben, your first set of middle grade novels is a trilogy called, as you said earlier, Winter House. Did you intend to make this a trilogy when you began this project? No. As I mentioned, this whole journey of like just trying to write a book and then settling on a kid's book. And I really had no idea what I was doing. And I had no insight or understanding of the business side of writing or the publishing business at all. So I finished this book, Winter House, and it was, you know, a regular-sized book. 
it ended up being like about 350 pages. So, you know, it's a real book. It's not just a short little thing, right? I got online and I started poking around for an agent. I knew enough to know that I needed an agent to represent me, but I didn't know how to secure one. So I looked around and I found an agent online. Actually, I got rejected by about 45 agents in a <laughs> row. And then I found one who said, I like this story. Send me the whole thing because I just sent her a little snippet of it. And she liked it and said, you know, I, I'll, I'd like to sign you up as like a client. And I said, great, because in my mind, I'm thinking it's not like I have other options. I don't have other other agents, you know, hungry to secure me. So you're the one. I got super lucky. Her name is Rena Rossner, and she's just fantastic. So she really liked the story, and she started shopping it around. And an editor at Macmillan, which is, as I have come to learn, you know, one of the top four or five book publishing companies in the entire world really liked the book and she's an editor her name is Christy Ottaviano and she's a fantastic lady and like Rena Rossner my agent has become a good friend and you know, just a huge collaborator and supporter of what I do and and so Christy said hey I really like this Winterhouse book could you turn it into a trilogy and I was pretty stunned by that because like a lot of people who want to publish a book or write a book, I just was hoping maybe, maybe someday I would have one book published and to have an editor at a real book company say, hmm, we'd like to publish three of your books seem nothing short of a miracle to me. So I said, well, yeah, I can try. So I quickly created a synopsis for two more books and Christy liked them. And in short order, Macmillan offered me a three book contract and the whole thing again seemed quite miraculous to me and completely unexpected i sat down and looked at the math and thought about numbers and where i am in my life and within about a month i told my manager at microsoft i'm gonna quit <laughs> <laughs> because uh microsoft was a fantastic place but you know in my heart i wanted to be a writer and here was my chance to commit to it full time so that was over six years ago i had been a writer full time but to get back to your question, I had no inkling that I would be writing a trilogy. It was really Christy, my editor, asked if I could turn the one book into three. And so I came up with ideas and I did. I turned it into a trilogy and Macmillan you know, ended up publishing the three books over three successive years. And they've come out in paperback. And again, an additional miracle. They've been published in 10 languages around the world. And it's just been beyond my wildest dreams actually to see how this has progressed it's fantastic you know when you love to do something to be able to share it with other people and to have other people respond and like what you do and them to get some meaning or enjoyment out of it is quite a thrill to me so that's the deal i, I never expected it to be three books and i only hoped one day to publish just one and here it is so what's the trilogy about it's a story of a girl in the first book. It's a girl. Her name is Elizabeth Summers, and she's 11 years old. And she lives with a kind of an unpleasant aunt and uncle, which is a bit of a trope in a lot of these stories. But it is what it is. It's existed since the time of the Brothers Grimm and maybe way, way before that. She's not happy where she is, and she's a big bookworm. And then out of the blue, through some weird circumstance, her aunt and uncle send her away to some unknown strange place for the winter holiday. She has three weeks off from school in December and January. This place called the Winter House Hotel. She has no idea how they have the money to send her there or why they're sending her there or how they can afford it or anything. And she figures it's going to be terrible. But when she arrives at this place called the Winter House Hotel, it's in this sort of indeterminate, snowy, northern, mountainous place. It's fantastic. And she falls in love with it right away. And there's a huge library there. It's this enormous 13-story tall festive hotel. And there's all the books you can imagine in this three-story library. And it's just this incredible place. But she finds out right away there's something strange going on in the hotel. And I don't want to give too much away for the readers who might read the book. But she very quickly comes to understand there's a sort of a darker history to the place and she gets involved in a strange book that she finds in the library and, and more involved in, in a set of circumstances that have existed with the family that's run this hotel for over a century. And a lot of troubling, dangerous things start to begin. And she makes a good friend there, a boy about her age, who's also visiting the hotel on his own over the winter holiday. They have all these adventures and get involved in a lot of danger. And Elizabeth and her new friend Freddie have to 
sort of solve a lot of uh, mysteries and clues and puzzles in order to eventually kind of rescue the hotel from some dangers that that are occurring so uh, that sounds a little vague but you can maybe <laughs> understand I, I don't want to give away too much but that's kind of the outline of the story and that's kind of book one and then in book two she actually returns to the hotel a year later you know the dangers kind of deepen and in the third book that wraps things up a few months after the second book the dangers deepen even more but I hope resolve and Elizabeth shows her mettle by helping to make sure that the Winter House Hotel will thrive and be safe. So I'll kind of leave it at that. But over the three books, it shows Elizabeth getting a little bit older, learning a little bit from her mistakes, having some ups and downs with friends and with people at the hotel and testing herself and trying to figure out what she can do to preserve this place, this hotel that she grows to love very much. So, Ben, would you like to read an excerpt from Winter House? I will. I'll read a short excerpt from, this is from book one. You know, there's lots of places I could have read. I could have even read the first chapter just to kind of give the readers an introduction to what the story is all about. But I figure I'll just read a really short passage about two thirds of the way in. And just to set it up, as I mentioned, Elizabeth and her friend Freddie have gone through a lot of dangerous things already. They've been trying to figure out what's going on in the hotel. But at one point they have kind of an argument. And Elizabeth feels pretty bad about this because here she's made a new friend and now she's had a fight with him. And this she, she hasn't had a whole lot of close friends in her life. So she's trying to figure out what that's all about. And did she make a mistake or did Freddie make a mistake? So she goes to the library because she's made friends with a librarian, an elderly woman named Leona Springer, who's about 70 and loves books just as much as Elizabeth does. And she's sort of talking things over with Leona. Now, there's another major character at the hotel. His name is Norbridge Falls. And Norbridge is also about 70. And he's the owner or the proprietor of the Winter House Hotel. His family has run the hotel for over a century. So you'll hear some of these names here. So here we have this scene. Elizabeth's had this fight with her good friend, Freddie. She's turning to Leona Springer for a little consolation and understanding. But also Leona is telling her a little bit more about this strange story about the hotel because Norbridge, the owner, and Leona is good friends with Norbridge and has been for decades. Norbridge had a twin sister, a woman named Gracella, has historically been menacing the hotel and may be back to do the same thing now. So that's kind of the setup. So here we are, Leona and Elizabeth in the library. And Leona, after telling this story, says to Elizabeth, goodness, I hope I haven't frightened you. Elizabeth didn't know what to say or make of what she'd heard. Before she could think of anything, Leona pointed to a lectern at the back of her office. There, sitting open upon a reading stand, lay a thick volume that Elizabeth hadn't noticed before. It reminded her of a dictionary. You seem very interested in the history of this old hotel, Leona said. I should have told you about this book before. It's a one-of-a-kind personal account of Winter House written by one of Norbridge's relatives, Marshall Falls. He was quite an eccentric, but my, did he love to write. Elizabeth eyed the thick journal. That book looks huge. It's his very own journal, filled with drawings and photographs. Everything you would ever want to know about Winterhouse is in there, at least from old Marshall's unique perspective. Elizabeth wanted to jump up and examine the book immediately. You must have seen so many things here over the years, Leona. I can't even imagine. Leona nodded. Winterhouse is a special place, she said, a very special place. Like what Norbridge said the other night about how people like to come here? Exactly. But it's more than that, Elizabeth, I believe. Norbridge might not ever say this aloud, but I will. To me, Winter House isn't just a place where people come to enjoy themselves or, or eat good meals or have fun. Certainly it's all of that, but it's more too. When people come here, they take something away with them, just like when you go to a beautiful museum or a wonderful park for the afternoon. At least that's what I believe. Elizabeth thought back to the way she'd felt her first evening at Winter House, after she'd been astounded by her initial view of the hotel and then the things Norbridge had shown her as he'd walked her to her room. Above all, she had thought of how she'd felt when, during those first few minutes in her room, she'd parted the curtains and gazed out at Lake Luna and the mountains beyond. I think I know what you mean, she said. I'm a very biased old librarian, I'll confess, Leona said, but I believe Winterhouse is one of those places in this world 
that isn't just to be enjoyed, but that actually increases the amount of goodness that exists. She widened her eyes as if to make light just a tiny bit of how momentous it all sounded, although her point had been absolutely sincere. So hooray for Winterhouse, in my estimation. Norbridge sure has a lot to keep him busy, Elizabeth said. He does an amazing job. Elizabeth looked down, plucked at the sleeve of her sweater. She was thinking about Freddie again and how maybe she had been the one to cause the difficulties between them. You and Norbridge have been friends all these years, she said, and Leona nodded. But did you ever disagree about anything, like have fights or arguments? Leona let out a small laugh. Well, of course, dear, she said. That's par for the course. Two people will never think exactly alike, no matter how much they care for each other. She hesitated, waited a moment for Elizabeth to speak, and then went on. But we always work things out because we care about each other, and Norbridge is the best friend I ever could have hoped for. So I'll leave it at that. But again, it's it's not maybe the most exciting part of the story, obviously, but I wanted to give an indication of sort of Elizabeth's growing sense of what the hotel means. And I want the reader to understand, you know, there's something more going on here than this just being a fun place to visit. And also to see Elizabeth trying to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a friend to someone. So that's why I chose that passage to read. We had just listened to Ben Gooderson read from his uh, first book in a trilogy called Winter House, and he's an author of middle-grade novels and recently published his fourth book, The Einsteins of Vista Point. His previous books, again, are the Winter House trilogy, which has been translated into 10 languages and even received notice from some state, national, international awards. So, Ben, let's talk about your most recent novel, called The Einsteins of Vista Point. What is this yes. story about? Well, basically it's a family with the last name Einstein. And there's a mother and a father, and there's four children, although there used to be five. They lived in a town kind of like Portland, Oregon. But unfortunately, about a year before the book begins, or the story begins, the youngest member of the family was killed in, in an accident. So it's a very tragic thing. So you can see right away, it's a very different story from the Winter House stories. So obviously the family is experiencing an immense amount of grief. In particular, the, the now youngest member of the family, Zach, he's 11. He was with his younger sister at the time. And of all the members of the family, he's feeling the, or experiencing the most guilt and confusion and grief about what's going on. So the family has moved from the Portland type town to a rural area called Vista Point, about an hour east of Portland. And they're just trying to regroup and start a new life. They've bought property there and they're going to open a bed and breakfast and just kind of start over and try to not, you know, not put the death of the, the youngest daughter behind them, but kind of make sense of their life in a new location. At the beginning of the story, Zach, the youngest one who the story is kind of about, he's just sort of a real kind of malaise. He, he doesn't want to do a lot. He doesn't want to interact with the family much. Just kind of wants to be left alone, be in his room, read books and just kind of, you know, sulk and, and experience his grief and go through it. He's looking out the window of the new house. They've only been there a few days. And he sees a girl come out of the forest and head for this big stone building that's on the fringe of the family's new property. And the building is this dilapidated stone tower about three or four stories tall that used to be a really grand kind of observation place when the old highway used to run through this property. And that was decades before. And Zach is very intrigued to see this girl there and goes out to see what's going on. And that kind of gets the story going. And as you get deeper into it, there's sort of a mystery around this girl. Then one evening, the four kids in the, the Einstein family see lights flashing from across the river as they're looking at the stars one night. And the family gets pulled into a strange mystery involving some people who used to live in the area of Vista Point. And also Zach's trying to understand this new friend of his this girl who, who he discovers who comes out of the forest every once in a while. So th that's, that's kind of what's going on. It's a more serious book, I'd say, than the Winter House ones, primarily about this family, and particularly Zach, trying to come to terms with this tragedy that's occurred and his own experience of grief. And what inspired you to write this novel? The inspiration came from the location itself, because really about an hour east of Portland, there's a beautiful area with all these waterfalls along the border between Oregon and Washington, along the Columbia River on the Oregon side. And there really is a beautiful 
stone tower. It's called the Vista House, and it's at a place called Crown Point. If anyone even looks it up, you'll see this amazing picture of this beautiful building. It's a very sort of Art Deco-looking thing on this bluff, very dramatic spot with views or vistas uh, across the river and in all directions. It's just spectacular. And I went there years ago, and I've been back many times since. The first time I was there, I was just staggered by the site because it's so beautiful. And it just stayed in my mind. And I just always thought it'd be so cool to set a story at this spot. I thought, you know, what if this tower had become run down? And then I started thinking, what if a family owned the property? And what if the family sort of analogously, they were kind of run down and they needed to kind of put themselves back together. And and from there, I just thought, well, why would the family be in need of some kind of renewal? And maybe they suffered a personal tragedy. And then from there, the story just kind of came together. And that's, but the initial attraction was the location, was the place. I was so stirred by this beautiful building that I just kept trying to imagine what kind of story could take place there. And that's what really drew me forward. So would you like to read an excerpt from the Einsteins of Vista Point? I will. This is very early in the story, and I'm not giving anything away because this is sort of what anyone reading about the book would know. The four kids, the oldest one is Ethan. He's about 16. And then there's two girls, Miriam and Ruth, a little bit younger. And then there's Zach, who's 11. The four kids... They've only been at their new place about five or six days. And here they are late at night and they've gone out to this tower because the tower is about a hundred yards away from their house. They're looking at the stars and they're just sitting by the tower. They don't go in it because it's broken down and they're not supposed to go inside, but they're sitting kind of right near the tower. And suddenly from the far side of the river, someone starts flashing lights at them and they can't figure out what is going on. So I'll read that passage and I'll skip around just a little bit to keep it fairly short. So the four kids are sitting there and then all of a sudden, hey, what's that? Ruth said abruptly. A peculiar and urgent note in her voice caused the others to freeze. The way she spoke made Zach think she'd heard a noise nearby. But when he turned to look at his sister, she was peering directly across the river, far into the blackness of the opposite side. He looked too. There, from within the dense bulk of shadow that rose up from the river on the northern shore, a light flashed. What? Miriam said. Look there, Ethan said, standing. He took a step and pointed. A light flashing. Oh, yeah, Miriam said. Hey, I see it. Is that a car? Ruth said. No idea, Ethan answered. The flickering continued as the four kids watched. There were a few faint scattered lights among the stretch of blackness on the far side from houses tucked away in the trees or some lamps along the road there. But the opposite side of the river from Vista Point was basically a single wall of shadow. And now a conspicuously bright light was flashing. What do you think it is? Zach said. As he spoke the words, an instant from one of his books came to him. Hey, you know what? In the fourth Falcons and Bandits book, the kids contact these other kids by flashing lights at them. Maybe it's something like that. Ethan slapped his hand to his forehead with a loud smack. You're a genius, Z. I should have known right off. That's Morse code. I'm positive. We learned about it at camp last year. Morse code, like dot dash and all that, Miriam said. Yeah, Ethan said. You signal the letters and they add up to words. And then a message, Ruth said. Someone's sending us a message. It's like a story. Wait, 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 Miriam said. It's dark out. No one knows we're here, and why would anyone send a message anyway? It's just a coincidence. That looks extremely deliberate, Ethan said. Oh, man, I wish I had a piece of paper so I could write this down. Let's just try to remember what the flashes are, he said. But just then, the light blinked out. It had lasted three minutes at most, but now there was only blackness once more. The four kids waited for the light to resume. They were so eager to have it start back up that they were each mentally willing it to begin again. But after nearly a minute of waiting, it seemed all had ended. Let there be light, Miriam yelled. She turned to Ethan, who was staring at her. That's sacrilegious, you know. Enough, Ruth interrupted. That was so cool what we just saw. A message, a coded message. Zach looked to his brother. Do you really think that's what it was? I do, Ethan said. I don't know what else it could be. But... 
If someone's way over there flashing lights at 10 o'clock at night, Miriam said, they would be trying to communicate with someone over here, and that makes no sense. Why not just pick up the phone or drive over here? Well, Ruth said, maybe they were signaling to someone. Or, I don't know. That light was more like a beam, I think, Ethan said, aiming right up here. Makes no sense, Miriam said. We got to tell Mom and Dad about this, Ethan said. Or we could keep it our secret, Ruth said, more mysterious that way. Zach took a few steps forward, closer to the edge of the bluff, and he stared into the blackness. The buzzing sound came to him, some sensation from the forest and the black sky and the river below. For a moment, he felt certain the light would start up again. What if someone's looking for someone else, he said, a person who's lost? Silence. Zach continued to stare across the river. That was a message he said. I know it was. So I'll leave it at that, but hopefully you can sort of see Zach intuits there's something deeper going on here. And the others are very excited. You know, there's this mystery. It's kind of cool to see lights flashing and what's going on. But Zach, the one most deeply affected by his sister's death, hopefully the reader starts to understand Zach is maybe cued into the fact that maybe there's something happening here at a deeper level and he wants to pursue it. So that's it's an indication of sort of what the story is about. Ben just read from his recently published fourth book, The Einsteins of Vista Point. His previous books are the Winter House Trilogy, which have been translated into 10 languages and even received notice from some state, national, and international awards. Ben, do you have a next novel in the works? I just had the, the Einstein's Vista Point just came out a couple months ago. And then in about a year, I'll have another book. It'll be the first of a two book series. And then I'll have a third book after that, a standalone. So I feel super lucky. The, the fate that my editor, Christy Ottaviano, she's at Little Brown uh, now, has shown in me. And I have three books coming out over the next three years. It's, it's really fantastic to be able to write books for kids. So yeah, those are the next one. That's, the next book tentatively called The Number Nine Plaza. And I've set it in what I've created as the largest department store in the entire world. It's a 19-story tall department store in southern Siberia. And it's run by a family called the Wine Bees. A boy named Herbert Olinga comes there for his summer vacation. His grandmother, Zena Winebee, runs the department store. And as you can maybe imagine in stories for uh, this age level, right away, Herbert gets involved in a mystery. There's a golden plate that's gone missing that used to belong to Zena and the Winebee family, and Herbert wants to help uh, his grandmother find this missing golden plate. And there's mystery and suspense and danger and codes and puzzles, because I like all that kind of stuff as well. So it's tons of fun to write those kinds of books. And that's, so yeah, that's what's up next for me. Ben, what do you think your life would have been like if you had not run into the Baha'i faith? The Baha'i faith has given me a lot of direction. I have a long way to go. I think we're all in that same boat. I definitely have a lot of learnings, a lot of challenges in my life, my personal life. But without the Baha'i faith and the teachings of the faith and really the support of the Baha'i community and so many dear and really beautiful, loving, compassionate friends have really helped me in, in some of my more difficult times. I'm certain I would feel and be much more sort of uncertain about my path in life without the faith. And I'm really grateful to have encountered such a beautiful world religion that's trying to, in my estimation, bring so much peace and harmony to, to all humanity. And definitely I continue to try to be on that path in, in my own life. So I'm just very grateful that I have encountered the faith. If I'd never gone to the temple and will met, I don't know that I would have delved into to learning much about the Baha'i faith at all, if, if really ever. Ben, I want to thank you so much for telling your story and describing your work for us. Thank you very much. Well, huge thanks to you, Warren. It's a real thrill to be able to talk to you, and uh, I really enjoyed the conversation with you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Ben Gooderson, author of Middle Grade Novels, his most recently published book is Einstein's of Vista Point. You can find his work at bengooderson.com. That's Ben, B-E-N, Gooderson, G-U-T-E-R-S-O-N.com.
You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahighperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. You can find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i Faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. weight I carry around deep inside me makes it harder to fly free so fly little one fly you're the answer to the prayers of every saint that longed to die no earthly things on your clean tiny wings made only of virtue and the sky so fly, little one,
compassionate God Bestow upon me a heart Which like unto a glass Bestow upon me a heart Which like unto a glass May be illumined with the light of thy love And confer upon me thoughts Which may change this world Into a rose garden Bestow upon me a heart Which like unto a glass May be illumined with the light of thy love Illumined with the light of thy love Bestow upon me a heart Which like unto a glass May be illumined with the light of thy love Illumined with the light of thy love Yeah the brow 